And uh, among other things, we know that uh, COVID is just uh, raging right now. I don't know how high the case numbers are going to go, but it could get worse still, could get quite a lot worse. Uh, but there are reasons for hope as well. Uh, the news about vaccines is very good, I think. And it seems likely if we can just make it through the winter, we'll be okay. And we'll resume normal activities at some point. And we'll reopen Zen Center and we'll gather in our new Zendo. And maybe some of our new long distance friends, maybe you can uh, come and visit. Maybe you can come for a weekend or a week or a month and uh, practice with us. That would be something to look forward to for us and for you. So uh, we just got to hang on. I know we can do this. Uh, it's easier when we know it's not going to be forever. And um, we have our practice to support us. We have our community to support us. Uh, our community may be online, but it is strong. And maybe uh, we can think of this as our monastic winter. Maybe we'll look back on this someday and we'll say, we did this pretty well. We might say, well, we fell apart a few times, but we fell apart together with all beings and we came back together again with all beings. And we can get through all of this with our compassion intact. So yes, we can do this. Please be careful. Please be careful, especially during the holidays. I don't want any more names on my home altar. And please reach out if you need support. Reach out to a teacher at Zen Center. Come to Zazen. Come to Tuesday night and hear a talk. Come on Sunday morning. Check out the website and see all of the things there are that you could be doing. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a bad winter. And here's my advice for what it's worth. You don't have to take it. Uh, sit in Zazen a lot and get outside a lot if you're able. Get yourself a good cushion, get yourself a good parka. And for the sake of all beings, get yourself some good snow boots and get out there and keep moving. Every day of this isolation is an opportunity to wake up. So that was my intro. And now here's my talk. And this morning, I'm going to talk about names, the power of names. Names are nothing at all. And sometimes names can be everything. And what prompted this talk was a discussion that we had in a morning study group. Uh, we've been meeting for several weeks in morning study group, a really nice group of, uh, of 10 people. And we've been using the book of Householder Koans, which was written by Eve Mion and Marco and Wendy Agyoku Nakao. And it's a really good book. They're koans, but they come from everyday life. And they've prompted really great uh, discussions. And it seems often in our morning study group that we come to this place as a group that koans are designed to bring us to, which is kind of being intimate and being present in the face of the great mystery up close and present. And one koan that we did that really sparked a good discussion was called Names. And I'm going to read you the koan. Daikon attended the weekly meeting of a social service agency where the staff argued about how to refer to the people being served. Some thought they should be called clients. Others wanted them to be called program participants. Some didn't understand why they couldn't be called patients, which was an old, widely used label. The program director finally asked them, if you were being served by this program, what would you want to be called? And that's the core. And it was surprising how much this 
this brought up um, in the commentary, uh, the authors say, uh, do names capture who we really are? Can words capture the totality of life? The best name in the world only points to something. It is not the thing itself. So how do we remember that moon, the word moon, is not the moon? That chocolate doesn't begin to capture that impossibly dusky concoction. And what about the word love? And she says, words are no escape. Words and names are important, but please remember that while the person is fluid, the name is not. That's probably why people change their names. So names can be so limiting because we can name things, then we begin to think that they have a fixed existence separate from other things. They're separate and they don't change. They are the thing, they have a name now. And as soon as we name it, we may lose our curiosity about it. We're unable to accept that it's going to change. We take a snapshot of a process of continual change and we call that snapshot a thing. What we call the wind isn't a thing at all. It's a dynamic process in which relationships between things change. The bending tree isn't separate from the wind. Is the tree moving? Is it the air that's moving? Or is it the mind that's moving? How can any of this have an accurate name? A name or a description can be limiting, such as he's a difficult person, or she's a good sport, or good dog, bad dog, or problem child. You get labeled at the age of six, your label goes in a file somewhere, and that's who you are, and that's what you end up acting out, and that's what you end up working with your whole life. And uh, the author, which in this case is uh, Eve, talks about the names she's had during her life. Um, and uh, first she was called Eve, then she was called Mionin by her Dharma name. Her parents called her uh, Chava, an affectionate version of the Hebrew name she was given at birth. And she says, maybe you think these are three different names for the same person, but is it the same person? Uh, Eve is my name as an adult. Uh, Chava brings back not only family associations, but also uh, the trauma of the Holocaust and a religious Jewish upbringing. Miyonin evokes Zen training, Japan, etc. She migrates from one world to another. And she says her teacher, her teacher Bernie Glassman, had Dharma names galore, but he preferred to use Bernie because of its associations with his Jewish communist roots. When you call him Bernie, his behavior, intonation, and slang evoked Brooklyn, New York, where he grew up. But he began to behave pretty outrageously if someone called him Bubi Sattva, the name he chose for himself when he founded the Order of Disorder and Order of Clowns. So we could probably all tell stories about this, about different names we've gone by uh, during our life and how they sometimes fit us and they sometimes limit us. Sometimes they enrage us, sometimes they sadden us. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the evolution of my own name at the risk of boring you. I will do this. When I was little, when I was a little kid, I was Teddy. And I liked being Teddy. It was an affectionate name that, um, that uh, adults gave me. And I spelled it with a Y. My grandma spelled it with an IE. And I thought that was especially nice. I don't know why. But when I got older, if people called me Teddy, I did not like it. I can remember this one guy when I worked at a packing plant. I was a, uh, there was this one manager. I was a union steward. He was kind of this hardcore manager. We did not get along. And I was a little, I was a little more like this back then. And he would call me Teddy. And I did not like that at all because he was doing it to put me down. It was derisive. So, um, 
And my last name was Tool, Tool, which is kind of an odd name. I'd have to spell it every time. T-U-E-L. And they would say T-E what? No, T-U-E-L. Every time. And so my name was Ted Tool, which I never really enjoyed that name because it seems so abrupt. I'm like, you know, I love my parents, they're wonderful, but what were they thinking? You know, did they say it to themselves a few times? So all my life, I kind of say this name, which to me, you know, seems really abrupt. And sometimes people, um, uh, people would laugh at my name sometimes or make jokes about my name. So I have a lot of heat around that name. It caused me a lot of pain a lot of times. And then when I got married about uh, uh, 12 years ago, I changed my name from Tool to O'Toole, which is what it originally was a few generations back. And it sounds good. You put that O in there, Ted O'Toole, and it kind of flows. And I went to Ireland after I changed my name. And in Ireland, I'm Mr. O'Toole, Mr. O'Toole, as if it has four O's in it and it's got the soft rain of Ireland in it, you know. So I love this name. And um, I thought, OK, now I've got a common name, and I won't have those problems anymore. O'Toole, right? It's a common Irish name. Uh, there's Peter O'Toole, famous actor. But I still have to spell it, and it still causes problems. So would you spell your name? O apostrophe, capital T. OK, I've totally lost them. I got to go back. O apostrophe. And that apostrophe has caused so many problems. I had to re-register to vote about four times because the city of St. Paul couldn't handle an apostrophe in a name. Anyway, I've enjoyed being Mr. O'Toole. And then I uh, became Donan. I got my, uh, my Dharma name Donan, which means way of uh, mindfulness, when I got initiated in 1995. And that felt really good. That felt like that's me, Donan. And uh, my priest ordination in 2005, I became Ananda. And I love that name. And I kind of wish I could use it. But the way the system works in Zen is you really don't get to call me Ananda until after I die. Well, I guess that's something for me to look forward to, right? So anyway, so now I'm Donan O'Toole. At least when I, some places I'm Donan O'Toole. And I think that's a great name. So I've completely evolved from Ted Tool or Teddy to Donan O'Toole. And I still go by Ted because my family likes that, but I may ease into to Donan. But the point is our identities change. Nothing is fixed. We may wish to choose how we're going to be known rather than being known by a name that's given to us. Um, and I know that names can be uh, liberative and I know how much they can hurt. And um, in the commentary again, what's in a name? Family history, a parent's expectations, a lover's whisper. Remember the significance of nicknames in school? Now think of titles like Ms. versus Miss versus Mrs. And descriptive labels like patient versus client and mentally retarded versus mentally challenged. My brother was always called mentally retarded. Your brother's retarded, isn't he? That, that hurt, that, not a good word. Why do these generate strong passions and controversy? In fact, people are beaten and killed every day over names. And then she lists in italics this long series of names, some of which are so vile that I cannot uh, repeat them. Just the act of saying these words um, can provoke a violent reaction. And of course, my experience with names is nothing compared with many other people. You know, I'm a privileged person. It's nothing like how uh, African-American men were called boy for so long, or um, how people would be called one of these awful names that I can't even read. Imagine how limiting that would be to hear that for decades and decades. Uh, and what I've learned and I've got so much to learn still, and I make so many mistakes, but what I've learned is to be so careful with names, to really try to get it right, to really try to not impose my cultural context on others. Um, 
One time I remember uh, I uh, met a person uh, who um, is ethnically Hmong. And I asked him how to pronounce his name, which began with the letter X. And he told me, and the X was pronounced sh. And I said, oh, like S-H. And he had this kind of you know, look on his face, this kind of a grimace. And I realized when I say, oh, like S-H, I'm like, oh, well, let me put this in the dominant cultural context of the normal way we say it, rather than putting it in your cultural context, which is X is pronounced uh, a certain way. And that still bothers me. Um, and you need to be oh so careful. Um, and uh, it's going to happen. You need to be forgiving of yourself. But I remember that, and I'll try to avoid that kind of thing. And I remember when I was much younger, I worked at a homeless shelter in, uh, in Omaha and uh, was talking to one of the uh, clients one day. And he was an African-American man and I addressed him by his first name. And he said, you should call me Mr. You're younger than I am. And that was news to me. I didn't know that because of, of where I grew up. But I got that, and I'm so glad he corrected me. And that's important. It's important uh, to, to do this. So I've tried to be alert, um, because if I don't seek to understand where someone is coming from, and I name them according to where I'm coming from, I'm signaling that my culture is dominant. And if a group does that, it signals that the only way someone is welcome is if they adopt adapt to that dominant culture. And um, as we um, continued uh, to discuss this koan in a uh, morning study group, uh, the subject of pronouns came up. And this is something that's been on my mind quite a lot. I've been thinking about talking about this uh, for some time. Um, so, uh, this feels kind of new, not really new. When was I first at a meeting where people introduced themselves and gave their pronouns? I don't know, maybe two, three years ago, not that long ago. And I think to a lot of people, it's really kind of a new thing. And, uh, you know, you say, uh, my name is Ted, he, his, or he, him. Someone else might say they, them, or she, her. And this can feel a little uh, strange at first if we're not used to it. Um, somebody said to me once, uh, it, I, I'm like, do we have to do this now? This feels like a fad. This feels like we're all just kind of showing off how progressive we are. But it's not that. It's not about that at all. It's not about the speaker indicating something about uh, about themselves, about their own beliefs. It's about people. It's about being misnamed and how much that can hurt. And just being careful to not misname or misidentify anyone. I heard of a story of someone who came to a Zen center um, and at least a couple of people misgendered them and it was painful and they left and they don't practice Zen. And why did this happen? Because the burden was on the person who may have been transgender or non-binary uh, to correct the mistaken perception. Like, we're gonna make the mistake and you need to correct us. There was no mechanism, apparently in that situation, for politely uh, asking. So this is just about welcoming and the limiting power of names, or in this case, the limiting power of uh, pronouns. We can say, we're not individually or as a group going to make assumptions about someone based on our own perceptions and then place the burden on them to correct us. We can go back to the koan, clients, participants, patients, let's ask. What would you like to be called? Nothing is more Zen than that question. What would you like to be called? You tell me who you are. 
I won't tell you who you are. That's what we say to people. That's what we say to the universe. You tell me who you are. So I heard this story uh, about um, a guy uh, about my age uh, who had uh, several children. They were now adults, adult children, strange phrase, but I can't think of a better one. Uh, and one of these adult children uh, was uh, transgender. And this, uh, this, uh, this guy said, I totally support her. I think this is wonderful. She's found her true self. I want to do the right thing. But sometimes I get confused and sometimes I forget and it's kind of hard. So when I forget, here's what we've done. We've worked out a kind of a code word. So if we're sitting at the table and I use a wrong pronoun or something, someone uses this code word and I am reminded and I can correct myself. And I was so moved by that story and I'm moved now thinking about it because it just seems so very kind. Kind on the part of the adult child to say, I don't wanna shame you, but I want you to get it right. And kindness on the part of the parent to want to do the same. And I think the kindest thing we can do here at Zen Center is simply to ask up front when we're in a group, what are your pronouns? It's so simple. It's so kind. It's so, it doesn't have to be a big deal. And then we learn that and we might forget and then we correct ourselves and that's okay. We move on. We keep correcting ourselves till we get it right. So, um, and I think it's important to note uh, when it comes to talking about giving or our pronouns or talking about gender or race or sexual identity, that no one at Zen Center is telling anyone else what to say or what to do or what to think. Uh, if you go around the room, you can give your pronouns if you wish. You don't have to. You can add pronouns to your uh, email if you want. You can add your pronouns to your little Zoom box if you want, but you don't have to. And there shouldn't be any pressure about any of this either. We don't want an environment where people are afraid to speak up because they might say the wrong thing and, you know, ooh, like I'm condemned for it. And I don't think we have that kind of um, environment here, uh, not at all. And that's why I can talk about this stuff so easily. You know, I feel like I'm kind of putting myself out there and talking about this stuff because I'm addressing things I'm still learning about. And I may have made some factual errors this morning. I may have demonstrated some unconscious biases. I may even have said something hurtful. I really hope I haven't, but it's possible. It can happen, but we need room to talk about these things while knowing that, you know, it's, it's okay, we're working on it. Sometimes we're going, to, we're going to get it wrong, but we have to be willing to talk about it. We have to be willing uh, to get it wrong and kind of put ourselves out there uh, and take that risk. And here, I know I can do that. Like with the code word at the table, we can be very kind to each other because this is all about people. It's all about welcoming. That's all it is. It's just about welcoming. It's just about getting it right. What would you like to be called? Isn't it pleasant when people ask that and they listen very carefully to your answer? Who are you? What would you like to be called? That's a very good practice. And that's all I have to say this morning. And I would be uh, very happy if there are any comments or thoughts.